Okay, uh, well, it's a great pleasure to have um, Marty Charlemagne here. Um, and he's gonna tell us about his work on generating the Garrett's group. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the invite. I always have a warm feeling about Georgia because uh, it was the first real job I had, the one where I had an academic job where I had to teach and that sort of thing. Uh, before I came to Santa Barbara. So um, I forgot about it. it. It's nice to be back. Uh, <laughs> And as someone else has joked, my hotel room here feels just like home. So, okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about a program uh, that, that I was involved with, Mike Friedman. Um, and uh, it, it's aimed at understanding the Garrett's group, uh, which he sees as uh, a, a possible avenue toward understanding some problems in four-dimensional uh, physics that had come up. So let me start by kind of motivating what we're interested in. Uh, and this is gonna start at a fairly elementary level. Uh, you can think of any surface as uh, obtained by taking a boundary union of two planar surfaces, as I've shown here. Here's the, everything here is compact oriented, um, <clears throat> glued together along their boundaries. Uh, but, but that's not a kind of, there's not a sort of unique way of doing it. You can consider homeomorphisms uh, from the surface uh, that preserve this structure. Uh, so imagine you could take a, a, a surface with this structure, map it to it, itself. Even if it's the identity on Q, uh, on P, it could vary. And the variance is the braid group uh, determined by the grade, braid group acting on that planar surface. And of course, that's um, quite an interesting group and it's played a big role in low dimensional topology. So uh, what we'd like to do is think of uh, Hegar splittings as kind of a, an analog of this. Uh, any closed orientable three manifold is a boundary union of handle bodies. You can get it by taking a solid handle body A, solid handle uh, body B, gluing them together along the boundary. Um, somewhat in an analogy to the Braid group, um, the Garrett's group of a uh, manifold is the group of structure preserving homeomorphisms. So you take M to M in a way that preserves this division. And uh, to make it uh, uh, kind of manageable, uh, consider only those that are isotopic to the identity. So that's known as the Garrett's group of the manifold. And it's been studied now uh, and, and uh, much is known, but it's what's most surprising is how little is known about this. So thinking about this, remember, uh, and remembering that uh, uh, any orientation preserving homeomorphism from S3 to itself is isotopic to the identity, we can sort of forget about this last bit if we're looking at, uh, the, if the three manifold is S3, uh, we're looking at the group of structure preserving homeomorphisms. So homeomorphism from standard or from a uh, handle body, a uh, Higar decomposition of the of S3 to itself that preserves that. And using the fact that this is isotopic to the identity, you can imagine isotoping such a homeomorphism back to the identity. And as you do that, what you see is that the Higar surface uh, uh, in S3 kind of moves uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of loop. It just passes through uh, S3 and returns to itself. So that's uh, a, a very visual way of thinking what, of what the Garrett's group is for S3. Marty, so, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, just so structure preserving, does A have to go to A and B have to go to B? Uh, in, I, I'm going to assume that, yes. In okay. this, uh, All right. Uh, um, I'm not going to flip the sides here. Yeah, uh, it, it turns out that's not a uh, that's not an issue. I mean, it just makes the answer a little bit uh, slightly different. So uh, let's start with Waldhausen's theorem that any Hegard splitting of S3 is standard. So we know what we're looking at when we talk about uh, Hegard splittings of S3. And then the, we can think of the Garrett's group. This is not quite accurate. It's up to a Z2 factor. I don't think I. We'll get into, but you can think of the genus G Garrett's group of S3 
Well, you take the structure preserving homeomorphism and then isotope it back to itself. And you, you can watch the, this as an excursion of the standard genus G handle body uh, through space back to itself. Uh, and so you can think of this as a pi one, pi one embedding of T into S3. So let me give you some uh, examples here. And this is both an example and a uh, explanation for the name, the Garretts group. In 1933, uh, Garretts proved uh, that for genus two, three such excursions generated everything else. So here's a genus two Hegard splitting of S3. Uh, you can imagine three different types of generators. One is this Z2 generator that rotates around this axis by 180 degrees. Similarly, you could keep this factor, the left factor, uh, fixed. And on the right factor, you could twist halfway. That will take T, the Hegard surface, through itself and back to itself. And then this is the kind of surprising one, one you might not think of right off the bat. You can think of the standard genus two surface inside of S3 by taking two, uh, three spheres and connecting them by three different uh, one handles, as I've shown here. And then, then there's a Z3 action, this shown by the green, um, <clears throat> where you sort of notch it one third. So the upshot of Garrett's theorem is that the Garrett's group has three generators. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, I, if, if any of you are good at German, I, I'd be interested in any feedback on whether Garrett's really had a proof there. As I look through there, and I, I've asked uh, uh, others who have who speak German better than I, uh, whether they see an actual proof there, uh, and the answer comes back no. But anyway, uh, it's, it's very plausible, and uh, it's certainly known to be true now anyway. Okay, so now in 1980, a, uh, a, a graduate student for his thesis uh, named uh, Jerome Powell um, proposed uh, uh, a bunch of generators. They were five in that case. One of them turned out to be redundant uh, that would generate them for any genus. Actually, he thought he had proven this, uh, that those five uh, were sufficient, but it turned out there was an error discovered you know, 20 years later. Um, so, uh, I, I, well, uh, I, there's a story there which uh, uh, I think I won't repeat, but it, it was difficult to reach him to ask about this, and I, I never succeeded uh, because after graduate school, he became a silent monk. Um, so that he didn't go on into mathematics. But anyway, the, the, here are the examples of these uh, uh, generators. So he did it in a different way. This is going to be more useful. Uh, his generators lead to uh, these examples. You take a standard sum end and do a flip. We remember that from Garrett's. Similarly, or kind of an extension of the other uh, element, one of the other elements that uh, Garrett's described, you could do a switch of two uh, standard sum ends of, in, of the standard genus G splitting of S3. Or you could take a whole uh, sum end like this and kind of move it around. Uh, maybe call it a bubble move. You think of this as a bubble and you slide it around somehow and then return it to itself. And then in some sense, the most interesting is this move, uh, which I've sketched here. I'm gonna call it a primitive eyeglass twist. And I'll explain the terminology in a bit where you take two sum ends that are next to each other like this. And um, you take a one handle here and slide it all the way around the sort of meridian here and back to itself. Uh, so that's kind of a complicated uh, move. But uh, notice that, and, and this will become important, this is a really restricted element. Uh, if you try to, you know, kind of generalize it, think of other things like this that you could imagine. Well, for example, this hole could be knotted as it goes through and, and it would still work. There'd be uh, also be a, uh, you could also make a circuit like that. And this one handle doesn't have to be special. It doesn't have to be a member of a, uh, it doesn't have to be a generator. 
Uh, you could imagine just any arbitrary one handle going around some knotted hole. And, and uh, so one, perhaps one's intuition is that uh, Powell was being pretty optimistic, thinking that doing something this special would be enough uh, to generate all possible um, uh, Garrett's elements. OK? Any questions yet? Well, I mean, those, those other examples you were sort of hinting at, where you just take some random one handle, run it around some random path. Yeah. Right. Um, it did not doesn't doesn't look. They don't look like loops to me. Like, and they're going to get all tangled up. And oh, oh no, it's no. That's a, that's a good point. It's important that when you do this excursion of a one handle, that it goes around a hole like this. But it may not be this simple a hole. It could be, for example, uh, imagine this hole going through and being knotted up or something. Uh, the slide around this wouldn't even notice it. It doesn't go into that hole. It just goes around it. So uh, the, the, the main point I'm making is that the one handle here is very special. And also the loop that you go around is very special. Um, and so that's why I'm calling it a primitive eyeglass twist, because you could imagine easily generalizing. OK. Uh, so here's an example of something that would fit in Powell's framework. Uh, uh, you take this red one and this green one, and you kind of exchange them by a complicated, well, it's actually sort of a braid move on the complementary surface. So these are all Powell consistent, these kind of uh, uh, moves. And it's now known that the uh, Powell conjecture is known for genus two. Well, Garrett's proved that in 1933. That was kind of the inspiration. And uh, Mike Friedman and I showed for genus three uh, just three years ago. And uh, the question of genus four is still open. Uh, if anyone wants to get excited about it, I would recommend instead of trying to prove it, trying to prove that it's not true in genus four uh, by, for example, showing the genus four Garrett's group is infinitely generated. That would be enough to show that Powell conjecture is wrong. I don't know how you would do that. That's not really in my tool book. But if uh, somebody here is thinking about good problems, I think that's a that's a good problem. OK, does, so let's does, go. Does Powell consistent mean generated by those four? Yes, generators? right. Yeah. I like the initials of the, that they're PC. So, <laughs> OK. Uh, now, uh, going back to that point about primitive eyeglass twist, you can easily generalize this to what I'm just going to call an eyeglass twist, where you take any meridian uh, of, uh, of B, say, that's meant to be this blue meridian, any meridian of A, that's meant to be the red meridian, and you just slide the blue meridian around the red meridian or equivalently, the red meridian around the blue meridian, that generates, I mean, uh, first of all, it's pretty obvious this is this returns the thing to itself because it doesn't get tangled up below uh, because there's nothing below to get tangled up with. And similarly, it doesn't tangle up with anything above. So it returns to the original position, but it, it does uh, cause some difference in T itself namely an arc going through here on T. For example, this arc might be the intersection of a two sphere or a disc or something with the Hegard splitting, gets twisted up. It's basically equivalent to uh, you know, a, a simple braid move here uh, on the surface that will screw up the um, arcs that pass through. So let's generalize. Powell's hope for a primitive eyeglass twist and say, well, let's include all eyeglass twists. Uh, maybe that's enough to generate it. And so that's, the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, there's a kind of weak version, uh, which has the advantage that it's actually proven. Uh, and I, th I think it's more likely to be true. I mean, I don't think it's likely that you can strengthen this beyond genus three. So the theorem has kind of three parts. Um, if you take the Powell moves, but you add these eyeglass twists, which now takes it out of the realm of being finitely generated, uh, that this collection of moves does generate the whole Garrett's group. 
Uh, but an interesting fact is that and if you take an eyeglass twist, which you're using in this first uh, uh, part of the theorem, uh, if it leaves some, if somewhere else on this whole setting, some primitive um, <clears throat> sum and isn't affected, then you can actually show that that is a Powell move in the uh, Garrett's group of the larger genus uh, of the one that includes the extra sum in. So the Powell conjecture, well, I really doubt it's true uh, specifically, it's stably true. If you take any Garrett's element on a genus G splitting, uh, and you can make it Powell once if you add a, an, an extra generator. Well, I won't say more about that. I mean, that's that's just a, you, you just show it. I mean, it's a very short uh, argument, but a little hard to follow. It's very geometric. Um, so, you know, Powell was sort of stably right. Okay, so let me try and show how this is proven. Uh, and it, it goes really to the heart of a lot of modern Higard theory. So let's start with the definition. Uh, you have these two handle bodies, A and B, as I've said. Um, and you define a collection of disjoint disks, uh, some of them in A and some of them in B, as a weakly reducing collection of disks if both of them are non empty. I mean, just having a whole collection of A's that are uh, and with nothing in B, et cetera, that, that's, we don't want to consider those. Uh, we consider them weakly reducing. The fact that they're disjoint. Well, since one's in A and one's in B, aren't they automatically disjoint? No, they, they could intersect on the boundary. So we want to take ones that don't do that, that are disjoint on the boundary. And, uh, and you look at the, what happens if you do compressions uh, on all of them. Uh, if you picked a large enough collection so that uh, after you do these compressions, everything that's left over is genus zero, uh, then you call the collection complete. Um, so it was a, uh, a, 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 well, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Kasson and Gordon made great use of this and it kind of reawakened the whole theory of Higard splittings, this notion of weakly reducing. Uh, notice, but to, let's start here, that if you take a complete collection like I've described here um, and you collapse on that, you actually get a reducing uh, uh, sphere for S3 and T. So here is meant to be a kind of primitive example. You're supposed to think of this as kind of a knob here with some holes drilled in it. And then there are there's a collection of red disks lying inside this object. This is a much bigger knob here in which a smaller knob has been pushed in and the same kind of construction is done for B. But uh, you know technically, these kind of lie outside the surface. If, the, if A lies on, on the inside, these lie on the outside. And you imagine compressing all these things. Well, this knob goes away, this inside knob goes away, and you get a disk that nicely breaks up T into uh, a, a, a splitting that lies inside the big knob and a splitting that lies on the outside. So uh, if you start with a collection of, a complete collection of reducing uh, this, as I've described, you end up with a reducing sphere, and that's good because it simplifies the, the picture. Can, can I ask a question to get this? Sure. So, um, I mean, if I, if I'm, if I'm being boneheaded about it, I just do these reductions, and then the new surface I get is mostly the original surface plus some disks. But then to be a reducing sphere, does that mean I? perturb it until it's transverse to the original thing, and then I see that it cuts oh, it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Uh, what, you know, technically, well, what, what I'm imagining here is compressing these and then kind of isotoping them over so that they become this disk and similarly this disk. But what you've described is really, I mean, that comes up as part of the, uh, you know, a slight uh, uh, thing you have to fuss about. If you just do the compressions, as you've described, you end up with a sphere, but there are also uh, disks on it, and how do you decide? You have to choose a, a kind of curve on the resulting sphere that separates the A scars, the, the things left over from the A disks, uh, from those that are uh, defined by the B disks. And then you use that to sort of nudge them apart. Um, so, and it becomes a reducing 
sphere then. And you know, in the in the middle of the argument, you have to show that how you exactly separate them doesn't make any difference in the in, in the whole picture. Okay, other questions? Great. So here's the major theorem, 1984, reawakened, brought it back from the dead. Uh, Higard theory, a theorem of Cass and Gordon. It, it's actually much broader than this, but the part we'll need is uh, that even if you have just a pair of disks, A and B, that are weakly reducing, uh, you can create from them a complete weak, weakly reducing collection of disks. In other words, you can go from just having a pair of weakly reducing things to a reducing uh, sphere. So that's really exciting. Uh, but there are a lot of provisos here that make it less useful for the context I'm using it. Uh, for than one might hope. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Sorry, uh, what is a weakly reducing pair if you just have two disks? Well, uh, so if you have a pair of disks, one of them lying in A, one of them lying in B, and they're disjoint, so that it means their boundary doesn't intersect, mm -hmm. uh, you can compress on them. Mm -hmm. And that gives a surface sitting inside yep. S3, say. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you can create uh, a complete weakly reducing thing, something that uh -huh. reduces all of them away. So remember, a mm -hmm. complete one is that crushes yeah. everything to just a collection of spheres. Mm -hmm. I, I showed you that one sphere could come out. It could be a collection of spheres. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Um, but when, when you go through the guts of this, which I didn't, uh, hadn't really gone through until thinking about how to apply it in Garrett's context, you discover a lot of, a lot of catches here. Uh, actually, the ones you start with, the disks A and B you start with, don't necessarily end up in that complete weekly reducing collection at the end of the day. That's counterintuitive. You'd think it would just sort of expand into what you need, but actually A and B kind of disappear in the whole process. The collection isn't well defined. You're just said to do it maximally, but how you do it, there are very many choices involved. But if somehow, and I'm going to show you an argument, which if if you could figure out how to do this in a well defined way, um, up to Powell moves or weak Powell moves, um, that would give the theorem, uh, and that's kind of the goal. It actually turns out even doing that is uh, is difficult. Okay, let's see. So let me describe um, uh, the kind of mechanism that's used for the proof with that as background. What I'd like to do, so we're thinking about Higard splings of S3, and I would like to think of S3 in a standard way. You remove the poles, and the rest you can think of as just a two sphere cross zero one. And the right way to think about this from our point of view, uh, at, at, least, at least to match the diagrams I'm drawing, is that these S2s will be thought of as kind of level planes. I mean, what you'll see is the level planes uh, as S goes up from zero to one. So you're sort of sweeping up by planes through the picture. Um, for the, for the Heegaard surface T, which remember during this process, one of the things that's happening uh, when we think about the Garrett's group is the actual Heegaard surface we're looking at is going flying through space. Uh, it, it's actually doing sort of a loop of embeddings, starting out with a standard, ending up at the standard. But meanwhile, it's going through this loop. And what we'd like to do is to uh, uh, parameterize uh, T uh, or S3, I guess I should say, parameterize S3 as a product of the Ts. Uh, after we've re removed the spines. So both A and B have what are spines, things to uh, sort of one uh, graphs to which the uh, handle body uh, retracts. And if you subtract that, the rest consists of uh, products of T. So that's another dimension, T cross T. And we wanna see how these interact. And uh, there's a theorem uh, which, uh, Heim Rubinstein originally showed as part of some other uh, uh, much, uh, well, not, not focused on S3, a more general theorem, 
But uh, Yoav Rik got interested in just the application to S3 and wrote a wonderful paper. I, I, if you uh, ever get a chance, uh, uh, you might take a look at it. it. It proves this in a really beautiful way, uh, uh, sort of as a, a, a struggle between two contestants, the horizontal and the vertical, and, and you know whether one has to win is basically the outcome. Is this the, the game of hex thing? The game of hex, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a beautiful yeah, paper. Cool. Uh, what, what we showed, what he shows, is that if we take these two sweep outs, as I've described before, uh, there is a, uh, an S and a T so that uh, this actually, the, the horizontal surface S actually cuts off a weakly reducing pair, A on the inside and B, well, A on one side, I guess A here is, looks like it's on the outside kind of, and B is on the inside, uh, which you can then use to launch uh, the uh, Cass and Gordon uh, effort to get a reducing sphere. So that's that's a cheering thing. Uh, you can now do this with parameters. So what we're interested in, as I said, was a, a kind of loop of T going through S3. So you could now think of an S1 parameterized way of doing this. Um, namely, given this continuous family of uh, the Hegard surface moving through uh, space, so that represents a Garrett's element. Uh, you can actually choose using this Rika argument, a uh, weakly reducing pair that depends on theta. Uh, so we'll call them A theta and B theta, B theta. And it has nice properties. Uh, generically, as you know, most of the time it's just the same pair. But at certain times you have to switch. At a finite number of times, uh, but you only have to switch one. That's the point. Uh, say a theta will be constant uh, across that element. A theta plus epsilon is the same as a theta minus epsilon. Moreover, the old and the new B uh, compressing disks are disjoint. Uh, so there is a very well behaved pattern of weakly reducing pairs as you go around the circle. Uh, Thus, uh, these pairs kind of change in a controlled way. Well, you know, I have to say that all of this is Mike's idea, Mike Friedman's idea. And after he had this idea, he called uh, me up and thought, what did I think about that? You know, changing, going from there to a reducing disk and yada, yada, yada. And um, well, I was in the middle of emailing back explaining why this was hopeless when I realized, wait a minute, maybe it's not hopeless. Uh, so that's how we kind of got involved in it. He, he had the kind of this central idea, uh, and then the, the rest kind of flowed from that. Uh, so the hope and the plan is that uh, <clears throat> you apply Cass and Gordon, you get reducing spheres, and the hope would be that they would change in a controlled way. Now, the ideal control is that you could show that it was the same reducing sphere throughout the whole uh, T theta. Uh, if that were the case, then you could imagine an induction argument where you just break it up into two pieces and apply induction with a standard, with a single reducing sphere. Uh, you could uh, uh, just watch what happens on one side of the reducing sphere then on the other side and, and apply an inductive argument. But um, it suffices, as I'll talk about, uh, to do not that well, but if we could just find a chain of disjoint reducing spheres, that is you go as theta changes, you flip maybe to, an, to a disjoint reducing sphere uh, and not necessarily keep the same one. Um, and then uh, you could hope to induct on genus. So the question is, what can we get from a single pair of weakly reducing disks? I already mentioned that part of the problem with the Cass and Gordon uh, argument for this uh, application is that it, you, you just get a mess. Uh, you don't necessarily reducing sphere that you end up with is very difficult to tie to the original single pair. Uh, but you can do two things. Um, uh, one is to notice that when you do this weak compression, you actually get um, a surface coming out. It's no longer a Hegard surface. I've, so I've changed the letter from T to F, compressing A and compressing B. Uh, you, get a, you get a surface F 
you have the a side, you have two different sides of it. And this arc, uh, which is kind of the, the trace of this uh, compression by A, and similarly this arc on the other side, are actually part of a Hegard splitting for the inside of F and the outside of F. So you got two things. You get a, you get a surface here, and you get it split into two um, <clears throat> Hegard splittings. Uh, there's one Hegard splitting for the inside and one for the outside. Um, and what we'd like to do is to find a way to use this structure as a robust way for finding a reducing sphere. By re robust, I mean that as you go around the uh, circle, it remains the same. Okay, we have to bring in two uh, background theorems. Uh, one is a strong version of the Hocken theorem. And it basically says, if you have a reducing sphere or boundary reducing disk, you can mimic that by one for the uh, Hegard surface. Uh, to me, the most amazing thing about this theorem is that uh, it hadn't been proven before we started thinking about these things. So it was only last year that this was shown that you could actually recommend, you could actually uh, start with a reducing sphere for the three manifold and end up isotoping that to a reducing sphere for the Hegard splitting. We'll say that uh, T, the Hegard surface is aligned with uh, this, these boundary reducing disks and spheres. Uh, in that case. And this is this can be done uh, in some sense uniquely. That is the outcome, uh, if you end up with two different positionings that are aligned, T0 and T1, you can get from one to the other by not changing much, just doing an isotopy where they remain completely aligned. Um, and then the good news from Point of view of Garrett's is that uh, one other kind of move you may need, but the, the Garrett's assumption we're making uh, allows this is eyeglass twist. You might have to do that. And then here's the thing that kind of for S, apparently kills it for S3. This uniqueness uh, is only up to passing trivial sum ends of T, the Hegard surface, through uh, the uh, sphere or disk E. And the reason I say that it's really bad news is because for the standard Hegard splitting of S3, it's all trivial. So the fact that you can just pass trivial sum ends through these reducing spheres uh, makes it very hard to imagine uh, how to get at some real structure uh, using these theorems. And so that so now those two ideas converge. This idea of you making a chamber complex where you break up S3 into pieces, uh, and uh, this need to uh, not pass all the trivial sum ends through E come together, together with the eyeglass twist. Let me go back to uh, the picture now. If we have a level sphere cutting through this chamber complex, which is Hegard split, as I've shown here. We can now apply these theorems I just mentioned, the strong Hocken theorem and, the, um, uh, and, and its uniqueness to say the following. Well, that, now that I've compressed the red and the blue, the, the sphere is still going through there and it, it still is intersecting it in circles. Um, but what was previously an inside circle has now become part of the Hegard splitting. And according to the uh, the strong Hocken theorem, there's a way of isotoping this Hegard surface uh, away from this reducing sphere, the uh, reducing disk. The reducing disk is this kind of gray thing uh, over here, gray bounded thing. So in other words, you can slide this red handle uh, so it's disjoint from here and the blue handle as well. And then, then you've kind of simplified the intersection with the uh, surface F. Once you've done that, do it again. Uh, take this circle, compress, you get a blue handle, um, and you can continue in this way. So the hope is uh, um, <clears throat> that if you start out with a level sphere, as I described here, eventually, and you do this kind of compression, you end up with a reducing sphere that lies in a single chamber, as I've shown here. We then apply strong Hocken in that chamber, which no longer has the property that the, the bad property that S3 did, namely you could just make it all disappear by passing trivial sum ends through. 
to get S aligned uh, with the Heegaard splitting inside that chamber. But that means it's aligned back in uh, the original splitting. And then now I have to go back to the word hope. Uh, hope whatever the process you used is robust. Uh, that, by that I mean as you go around theta, uh, it, it's, uh, it doesn't give answers that are too different. In fact, what the hope will be that it issues kind of disjoint spheres uh, as you move around. And I'll show at the end why that's enough as long as we get disjoint spheres. One way of thinking about this two-stage process um, is by thinking about how uh, the, the surface, this chamber complex, which was originally given by the uh, weak reduction by the two disks, turns it into a surface splitting the Heegaard splitting. And you want to watch how that uh, operates on, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the level sphere. So this is meant to be a picture kind of of the level sphere here intersecting F. The intersections are, are these uh, circles here. And um, how we can use the, the sphere S to, and this two-stage process to make things simpler and simpler. You take innermost circles here. These are blue or innermost disks here. Here, these are in the blue region. I guess over here, they're in the red region. Uh, and you do the compression which turns them into one handles uh, in, of new chambers in the chamber complex. That's the first step. And then you use uh, the, the strong Hocken theorem to say, well, those new one handles can be isotoped away. So that what's left is the next stage of circles. So this tree that kind of defines the, the uh, or, or describes the, um, collection of circles of intersection between um, S, the level plane, and the chamber complex, that this tree gets shorter and shorter. And eventually it gets so short that it looks like a reducing sphere. Uh, so, I mean, what, what's fun about this is it's a, a nice case where you don't just start with by using innermost disks, but you iterate that process over and over again. It's kind of the sort of thing you've always hoped you could do if you're a three-dimensional topologist. And here's an example where, where it seems to be very helpful. OK, um, well, uh, this all assumes the choice of a good level sphere to do this on. Uh, I'll call it a guiding sphere for this process. And the question is, how do you choose one? How do we know which one to choose? How's, how's the time doing here? I don't have a clock. I guess I, OK. OK, so there are some observations about this process. And maybe I should go back to a picture of the process. But the first, I'll, I'll do that in a second. The observation is that these, this, as we do this two-stage process, one thing that doesn't change is the genus of the surface, the part of F that lies above S, or the part that lies below. The Euler characteristic, of course, changes as you compress these disks, but the genus does not. So let me just go back and uh, take a, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, let's see, maybe I can even go back. Well, let me, let me stop here. So if you imagine uh, this process of compressing the disks that lie on the level sphere, uh, notice as you do it, this started out as genus two lying above the uh, above the plane, genus two lying below, and these compressions don't change the genus uh, uh, of the surface. Uh, parts of the surface get turned into parts of the Heegaard splitting, but the remaining surface doesn't change genus. So for example, going from here to here, uh, the surface changes quite a bit. It changes from being a genus four connected to a genus uh, for disconnected, two different pieces, but the genus above and the genus below stay the same. Also notice that as S, as the sphere sweeps across uh, F, the genus starts, all the genus starts out above the plane. And at the end of the process, as you've swept across, all the genus lies below. 
So you can find a midpoint where kind of half the genus is below and half the genus is above. Uh, and that's kind of the place that, that's what we want to use for a sphere uh, that's a guiding sphere. So that's all meant to fit into what I said here. As the, as the plane or the sphere rises, uh, the genus above can only decline, the genus below can only rise. So eventually you find a level where the genus of F above and below are either both non-planar, both positive, or both zero. That's a possibility. It could be that the genus above and genus below are both zero. And that's the sphere that you want to use. A problem that will come up in a minute is how what happens as you go around theta, and how does this level sphere change? Well, the first thing to observe is uh, to, to that indicates this might actually be a good choice of sphere is that if you notice that if both F above and F below are non-planar, then at the end of the process, you'll have a planar surface above, a planar surface below. So S is really a reducing sphere for the chamber it lies in. It's uh, uh, because there's something non-spherical above it and something non-spherical, it has a non-spherical boundary above, non-spherical boundary below. Uh, so it's not, um, it's not just S3, uh, it, it's actually a reducing sphere uh, for that. And so you can make it aligned there. Uh, it's in a chamber and using strong Hocken, you can align it there. Well, if they're both planar, then that argument doesn't work. Uh, it, you just un, end up with sort of punctured balls above and below. But Cass and Gordon has said that one of the spheres that appear uh, in this process uh, will be a reducing sphere, and it's disjoint from uh, S. It's the spheres that end up here are disjoint from S. So in either case, you kind of end up with a good thing. Um, uh, but, but now let's ask if this process is robust. And just comparing these two, uh, notice that kind of the most you can hope for is that they're disjoint. In the non-planar case, S itself ends up as the reducing sphere. In the planar case, you end up with a reducing sphere that's disjoint from S. So the best one can hope for is that the, as you go around, the reducing spheres are um, disjoint. So that's what the hope is, that you can get a sequentially disjoint aligned spheres as you go through, um, as you go around theta. And when you finally re return to where you were, to pi, uh, you use exactly the same process topologically and all along using Hocken uniqueness to say that this is unique up to, um, uh, up to these eyeglass, up, up to the eyeglass group. So you end up a chain of, reduce, of reducing spheres, aligned spheres, which starts out with a particular sphere and ends up with that sphere after applying the Garrett's element that describes this loop of embeddings. So that's the kind of consequential end. Um, and uh, well, Here's the, I, I'm, I think I'm running very short on time, so I think I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, as you look at the coordinate S that shows the, the plane sweeping up, it's unbalanced below, all the genus lies above the plane. It's unbalanced when you're too high because all the genus lies below. You're looking for a place that's either uh, P or NP, that's the P versus NP problem, planar versus non-planar splitting. Uh, and you have to find a kind of path through this, which is always lying in a uh, planar or a, where both are planar and both are non-planar. And so there are issues that arise there. When you go through a planar region, you're going through single sag saddle singularities and you have to make sure uh, that, does, that doesn't mess up things. And you can also go through simultaneous saddle singularities. Well, there's a picture that's meant to show a simultaneous thing where one resolution gives a planar. This thing is planar balanced. If you look at the two halves, F plus and F minus, they're both planar. Whereas if you resolve them in a slightly different way, you know, just generically the opposite way, 
um, you end up with non-planar pieces. So there's a delicate argument why that doesn't matter. Um, okay. And also passing through, well, if, if any, <laughs> if after all of this, any of you want to actually look at the paper, which is kind of a sprawling all over the place, uh, the problem of getting from one, getting through a single saddle singularity is equivalent, it turns out, to the idea of using all the disks that the guiding sphere gives you and adding one. Uh, so this is meant to be a picture of that. Uh, so, and so if you read the paper and you wonder why am I obsessed with the problem of adding a single disk, it's because of this, this need here. If you imagine a plane sweeping up and going through a single critical point, the, the disks that are compressed change as you go through uh, by the addition, uh, perhaps, of a single disk. And so that's, uh, that's something that has to be tracked. I don't think I'll say anything more than that. In the end, you get this sequence of aligned spheres, as I've described, uh, with uh, uh, sequential ones disjoint. OK, so that's the proposition then, which I'll just, uh, uh, which just repeats. So uh, let me just try and finish quickly uh, why this is enough. Um, we use a strong inductive assumption, namely that if we had a simpler picture, if T prime had lower genus than T, then we knew the theorem, that the theorem is true anytime the genus is lower. We also go to a standard picture of S3 uh, with these standard sort of ways of cutting it up into standard summings and ask the question, what information do we know from a reducing sphere? And well, we know, we, we, let's say that two homeomorphisms uh, from S3T to itself are eyeglass equivalent if here we, I want you to think of the range here as the standard picture. If we go to the standard picture with one and back with the other, and you can get from one to the other uh, in the eyeglass group. Well, given an aligned sphere for S3T, which is all that comes out of the process I described earlier in the talk, you can find a homeomorphism, homeomorphism from, to the standard one so that the image of the circle, the circle that defines the reducing uh, sphere, goes to one of these CIs. Uh, that's basically Goldhausen's theorem. So if you've got a reducing circle, you can find a homeomorphism to this that goes to just a single one of these circles, and then apply the inductive hypothesis uh, to say that uh, once you've done that, doing the others is by the in inductive hypothesis are the same. So, uh, the point is this homeomorphism to the standard picture is completely determined by R. Uh, with that, then there's the you know kind of obvious observation that if you now consider what happens if you take a Garrett's element of R, well, it'll take the Garrett's operation on R and take them to the standard picture. So we end up with a, with a, a relation between uh, a this homeomorphism, the eyeglass equivalence uh, determined by R and that determined by tau of R, where tau is the Garrett's group. Um, and there's a uniqueness thing which uh, uh, comes out of Goldhausen. And ultimately, the point is that you have, if you have this chain, as I described, at each step in the chain, you have an eyeglass equivalence. And so in the end, you have an equivalence between rho given by this circle and uh, uh, this circle of intersection, or this reducing sphere, I guess, and the one given by tau of that. You apply this rule you've discovered up here, and you discovered that rho r naught is the same as rho r naught times tau inverse, and that's enough. You cancel rho r naught, and there you have tau eyeglass equivalent to the identity. So QED. Uh, and I, sorry about the rushing at the end, and uh, there's a lot I've omitted as well. It's kind of a long, sprawling proof. Uh, and I, I, you know, I would say that now that 
we know what the answer is, namely you sort of have to include these eyeglass things, there might be a simpler proof around for the whole theorem. I do want to say that I think this method or much of this method could apply in other kinds of splittings, uh, splitting, stabilized splittings of other manifolds. Uh, and I won't go into that, but I think it's a direction that's well worth exploring. Okay, I, I'll stop there. Let's thank Marty first and, and ask questions. Or... Awesome. Um, are there any questions anyone would like to ask on the record? Then we'll stop the recording and then we'll have the <laughs> other. Um, Well, so you kind of set yourself up at the end for uh, like, uh, I mean, just simple other manifolds like S1 cross S2, is that? Oh, um, you know, that would possibly be another. another. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, it, it, it's a question what even the good, uh, you know, conjectures for what splittings would look like uh, in, uh, for other manifolds. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, is there, a, a, what would be the Garrett's group for S1 cross S2? I, right. I don't know what, the, uh, what a natural conjecture would be for these. Um, but I think even going outside of Garrett's, uh, this idea of using weak, going, be able to go from weak reductions to reductions of the Higard splitting, which is kind of the core of this uh, argument could be useful uh, in a general setting where you have some kind of sweep out of a stabilized T-guard splitting on a manifold from one spine to another. Uh, uh, if, it's, if you can find weak reductions, uh, this method might be a way of kind of canonically finding a reduction that's associated with it up to eyeglass moves or something. And then the other maybe unfair question is, what was Mike thinking about for, about uh, physics? Uh, he Did was you know? intrigued. I, I, you know, he'd have to talk for himself. And, and one of the you know great things about Mike is he he knows everything, uh, and uh, much of it in language, for example, of physics that I don't understand. Uh, but what I did pick up is his picture from the point of view of uh, topological quantum uh, stuff, which I don't understand well, that the Garrett's group could be playing a role much as the Braid group plays uh, in, in three-dimensional uh, uh, top topological quantum theory. So. Oh, I see. So he, 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 they were going to build quantum computers with the Braid group. As, as well, the, I think there, there's a connection gonna, there to quantum computation too, right, uh, right. which I, is another thing I understand very little of. That's cool. Um, great. Any other on the record questions? Um, let's thank Marty again. Um, and and don't don't run away if you uh, would like to hang out and chat for a while. Um, I'll hang around a bit. Thank you very much.